thanks so much to everyone for joining us here this afternoon. Uh, if this is your first time to our beautiful new offices, welcome. We hope to see you again for more interesting conversations. It's an honor to welcome all of you and our distinguished panelists for this afternoon's event. I'm Jennifer Bradley. I'm the founding director of the Center for Urban Innovation here at the Aspen Institute. Since its founding in 2015, the Center for Urban Innovation has harnessed the innovative power of cities to make them great places for all of their residents, especially those in underserved neighborhoods, to live, work, connect, and flourish. The common thread in all our work is steering innovative products, practices, and processes towards greater inclusion and equity. We use the tools that the Aspen Institute has honed over the last half century to advance our goals. We frame problems and opportunities. We create and tell new stories about cities, innovation, and inclusion. We convene practitioners within and across cities. And we elevate positive examples of inclusive innovation and process change through blog interviews, case studies, and panel discussions like the one today. We are grateful to have an opportunity to hear about positive examples of innovation and change from a distinguished group of speakers. When Mayor Steve Goldsmith and his co-author Neil Kleeman sent me a preview copy of their new book, A New City OS, The Power of Open, Distributed, and Collaborative Governance, I read it not just as a person who works on urban innovation and government innovation, but also as someone who has lived in the district for 24 years and has seen enormous changes take place in city government, city wealth, and city outlook over that time. And so the question that I had when I read the book was, how can all residents take advantage of this new, more effective, open, and distributed and collaborative governance model that Steve has championed? Um, and since I run a center, I get to host events to answer my questions. We'll have opening remarks from Deputy Mayor Courtney Snowden, and then a panel discussion and some Q&A at the end. And after that, you're all invited to stay for a brief reception. We'll start off with Deputy Mayor for, economic, for Greater Economic Opportunity, Courtney Snowden. Her bio is incredibly impressive, and I think most of you have it, and I'll just hit some of the highlights here. Deputy Mayor Snowden is that rare creature, a sixth generation Washingtonian. How, how long ago, how many generate, how many, how long ago does that go back? A long time. Well, okay then. That's kind of cool. <laughs> uh, Deputy Mayor Snowden fo focuses on workforce and small business ecosystem in the district, and she has extensive experience in political strategy and lobbying. She lives in Ward 7 with her two sons. So, Deputy Mayor Snowden. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It is such an honor to be at the Aspen Institute. I'll tell you a little secret about me. I don't usually use microphones because I get nervous when I hold them and my hand shakes and your swag can be messed up when that happens. So uh, as you heard, I'm Courtney Snowden, Deputy Mayor for Greater Economic Opportunity and the first of its kind in the District of Columbia and the first in the entire country. The mayor, like many of us, how many people have been in DC 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? Any natives? Yes, that doesn't happen often in these rooms. Um, there are a number of us natives who've seen the city change significantly, and certain you longtime residents have as well. We have seen prosperity sweep through the city in ways that we would have never imagined, right? Have you been to a black church? Do you know about call and response? <laughs> Work with me, people. Um, we've, we, we never expected to see it, right? We never expected to see the 8th Street that we see today or the rejuvenated U Street that we see. Who would have ever thought that there would be a turning natural or a, a natural juice bar and vegan restaurant on MLK in Ward 8? Did you think that was going to happen? No, you didn't think it was going to happen. Here's what we know, though. As we've seen buildings grow up and prosperity expand across this city like you would have never guessed, we've also seen communities become even further removed from that prosperity. The mayor saw that on the campaign trail and decided to do, to take what we believe was a particularly innovative step to create a deputy mayor level position focused on in ensuring that we were expanding economic opportunity to district residents, no matter where they live, but in particular in overlooked and underserved communities. And so my colleague who you'll hear from, Deputy Mayor Kenner, does a lot of work and we work very closely together. While he builds buildings and other things and jobs, I build people. And so I am focused on making sure that we are growing small businesses along overlooked and underserved corridors uh, and that we are improving what was the absolute worst workforce system in the country. 
That's not a joke. We were 56 of 50, seriously. 56 of 50, and now we're number one. So we're incredibly proud of that great progress. We've done that through some really important and critically critical innovations. One, like the Aspire to Entrepreneurship Program, which is a program focused on helping returning citizens start their own businesses. Now you can imagine that some of our returning citizens have some business acumen, if you know what I mean. And so we've helped them to turn that biggest business acumen into legitimate businesses. In just four cohorts, we've started more than 13 businesses, each of which uh, together they've created 39 new working district residents. Applaud that. They created opportunities for district residents who were just like them, many of whom are also returning citizens. We partner with companies like Uber to help expand their footprint into Ward 7 uh, in a community that has gone overlooked and underserved for far too long. And so now Uber will open up 8,200 square feet on Minnesota Avenue and, and hire 25 new people right from the community. We didn't put a dollar of government funds in that project, but what's really exciting is they made sure to hire all DC-based businesses to build it out. We know that that activity on that corridor will help improve the quality of businesses along that corridor and importantly create more jobs for district residents. We have seen unemployment decrease by leaps and bounds across our city. We're down to 5.8%, but we've seen the most significant decreases. We've driven down unemployment most significantly in wards seven and eight. That's a big deal because we've done it by actually putting people to work and not just moving new people in. Um, and so we are actually, in fact, in Ward 7 at the lowest recorded levels in the history of the city. Here's what's amazing about this. All of this only happened because there was a senior level person specifically focused on figuring out how we grow and build overlooked and underserved communities, or do what I call help people gentrify in place. How do we ensure economic development happens to us, with us in our communities and not to us? And we have some really great partners across the government. You're going to hear from my colleague, Brian Kenner, but we also are focused on education. Uh, we're also focused on health and human services and public safety and making sure that we're building the types of communities where people can feel safe and flourish, but importantly, where they will get to stay. Two more um, initiatives that I'd like to talk about. We launched something called Financially Fit DC. Uh, if you haven't done so, go to financiallyfitdc.org. Uh, I'm sorry, .gov. This is a website that allows people to create uh, financial fitness plans. Uh, and what we've learned over time is that everyone needs that, not just our low-income residents. In fact, I have a number of friends who summer in the vineyard and go to Paris and have two Range Rovers but couldn't give me $20 if I needed it. <laughs> right? Uh, and so what we really focused on with this project is helping people really identify and, and achieve their financial fitness goals, but most importantly, really helping them to purchase homes. So you're going to hear, I bet, a bit about affordable housing on this panel. But what we, have, what we know for sure is as we get people connected to meaningful job opportunities and get them into the right opportunity that will allow them to sustain themselves in the district, if we're not connecting them to the right set of affordable housing and purchasing, they, they can't stay here and sustain themselves in the District of Columbia. And so we're very focused on that. And then finally, we're really focused on how we grow and expand workforce opportunities for district residents. So we do that through the Summer Youth Employment Program, which we've expanded to 20 to 24-year-olds. I'll tell you, some of our friends on the council don't think that was a good idea. So if you agree that Summer Youth Employment Programs are good, please call them and let them know. Um, and we've done it by creating some innovative partnerships like the DC Infrastructure Academy which is a partnership between district government uh, and all of the utilities and WMATA that will help train district residents for good paying jobs. The average wage is about $50 an hour. Can you believe that? $50 an hour. And we know that if we get DC residents into those low barrier opportunities, they will be able to sustain themselves in what is becoming an increasingly expensive city. The mayor has been incredibly clear about um, the, ne the necessity to really meaningfully focus on overlooked and underserved communities and doing so through employment and small businesses. We've been able to turn corridors around with a partnership across government. And what I know for sure is that if, as long as we can continue to do it, we can continue to keep longtime district residents here in the city raising their families owning homes, starting businesses, and contributing and benefiting from the prosperity that has swept through our city. So I'm honored to stay for a little bit of the panel. I know you're going to hear from, again, my colleague and some colleagues that we heard from recently. Um, and I hope you will join us in this work. Follow us on Twitter at DimGO Snowden uh, so that you can check out our work and tell everyone all about it. Thank you so much. We have uh, Deputy Mayor uh, for Planning and Economic Development, Brian Kenner. He focuses on major real estate development products like the District Wharf, on developing the city's inclusive economic development strategy, and on preserving affordable housing. We have Scott Kratz, 
the director of the 11th Street Bridge Project, which will connect Capitol Hill with communities east of the river in a way that emphasizes equity and community voice. And we have uh, Mayor Steve Goldsmith, who is a, a professor at Harvard, a former mayor of Indianapolis, and former deputy mayor of New York City. So Mayor Goldsmith, one of the things that um, struck me in uh, Deputy Mayor Snowden's litany of all of the things that the city is doing is that, as you note in the, in the beginning of your book, this is not something that city government was necessarily organized to do in its original incarnation in the progressive era. So can you talk to us a little bit about uh, your book and what you've discovered about how city governments can be more effective even as they are taking on entirely new and increasingly urgent tasks. And Elena, do you want to get the slide? Well, they could they could buy my book. All right. It's a place to start. Um, well, well uh, you asked a question. I have a slide. They don't quite match. Let's just do it this way. Um, so uh, I, I thought the deputy mayor's opening was Im important in a number of ways, right? So we we have. Uh, we have prosperity in cities and we have issues in cities, right? We, and we have lots of folks moving to cities. So what I've suggested in the book is, is, is the following. I'll do this really quickly. One is that we have t tools today to make our public employees smarter than they were before, right? And, and, and your question suggests, you know, we, we've set up this system of government where in order to protect us against corruption, we've, lim we've limited the discretion of public employees, right? So the way we've made it so that they can't abuse their discretion is we've eliminated their discretion. They all work in little rules and little boxes, and, and so it makes it difficult for bad folks to be good, in public, but it makes it really difficult for good, for good folks to be good, right? So, so we push people to the center. So we now have digital tools. We can make workers in the field smarter. We can see what's really happening in neighborhoods in real time. We can analyze in a digital way, all of those trends that are happening. We can predict outcomes before they occur, right? And so, so just it, it, one way to think about your question is that instead of acting uh, in a routine fashion, government can identify outliers, right? It can, it can predict gentrification. It can predict uh, abandoned homes, right? It can, it can match job jobs with the talents of individuals and kind of what's missing to get that individual into that job. So we have a lot smarter tools today than we've ever had before. And then the other issue uh, really is that um, we can listen in ways we never listened before. I, I, know, it's, I know it's different in the district, but uh, my history of community meetings is, is that they're not always a perfect way for communication and, and transparency, right? <laughs> so we now have tools that allow us not only to have in-person meetings, but if you're really intentional in reaching out to com communities, particularly those who are underserved, there's ways to listen to them with social media, uh, texting, and the like. So big changes in how we think about platform government, big changes in how we think about the uh, tools that a public employee will have in order to solve problems of people who are uh, underserved. Great. So Deputy Mayor Kenner, how is the district using some of these new tools? Can you connect like a process change with a, a different outcome in the city? You got, you got smarter internally by doing X and residents saw Y. Who, um, you know, one of the things that we decided to do, and this is about three and a half years ago, uh, and it was really under the uh, sort of the mayor's sort of idea plan was uh, affordable housing. And if I go back 20 years in the District of Columbia, I, I did see some hands for people who are 20 year or 30 year residents of the District of Columbia. I came to Washington at first in 1996. Uh, and so I remember lots of things about Washington in 1996. I remember the first time my car got broken into, which was right over by Shakespeare Theater in Penn Quarter. And if people know Penn Quarter today, you wouldn't think that your car would get broken into at 2 o'clock on a Saturday, right, generally. But my car got broken into 2 o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday in 1996 because <laughs> that was sort of that neighborhood at that time still. Um, Traditionally, I think, uh, as cities, uh, as, as Steve said, people are moving into cities. And I think one of the outcomes of that uh, over the last 20 years or so is that the traditional issues of urban locations, which have really been public safety and education, 
not, not generally, so I won't generalize, but I'll speak in Washington specifically, but I think you can see this in other larger cities, is getting better. Uh, you're finding people sending their kids more often than not when they come to a city, to a city school. You are finding generally in every city sort of has this, uh, many cities I've worked at, they have this uh, survey that they give their residents every couple of years that asks them, do you feel safer in your neighborhood? And I think generally, again, in Washington, you're seeing uh, that, that score increase. You're seeing people feeling safer uh, in their neighborhood and in different parts of Washington, D.C. Uh, so the interesting part for me is that uh, I think we're at a, at a place where it's not perfect, and that's not saying that crime and education issues aren't still relevant in Washington, D.C., but what I think it has done is it's made livability that much more of a pressing issue for people. Um, if anybody has voted in the District of Columbia in the last couple of years, you will see a party, uh, literally a, a party, as in like a Democrat, Republican, or whatever, called the rent is too damn high. Has anybody seen that on their ballot, right? Yeah. Uh, it's a funny moniker, right? But it's kind of a catchy saying. Um, and the interesting part uh, that I also find is that the rent is too damn high no matter how much money you make in the District of Columbia. If you make six figures in the District of Columbia, you may not be able to live in the neighborhood that you want to live in. Is that a true statement? Yes. yes. If you make 30% of the area median income, which is about thirty dollars or $40,000 a year, you may not be able to live in the neighborhood that you want to live in. And so that concept, that livability, no matter where you are on that area median income or how much money you make a spectrum, is becoming much more important to everybody's life, not just people who traditionally have been categorized as poor, but working class and even upper class people aren't able to live sometimes uh, in Washington, D.C., and in many major cities, uh, necessarily in the neighborhood that they want to live in, because the rent is too damn high. Uh, so one of the things that we tried to do, uh, going back three and a half years ago, is make a requirement, the steepest requirement at that time, that uh, if you're going to do a city development project, that 30% of your total units needed to be affordable. And how do we define affordability? We define affordability for those units as being 50% of those units need to be at 50% of area median income, and 50% of those units need to be no higher than 30% of area median income. And so those are relatively steep affordability numbers. To put that into uh, the income, HUD normally defines the area median income as a family of four. So a family of four, and the area median income for the Washington region, I haven't seen it recently, but it used to be somewhere around $111,000, $112,000 a year. I'm going to round for a second and just say 100. And so if you're making 30% of the area median income, that means a family of four is making somewhere between thirty dollars and $40,000 a year. And the same thing for 50% of area median income. It means you're making fifty dollars to $60,000 uh, a year for a family of four. And so this requirement that we have, I think, has not I think has yielded literally hundreds of additional affordable housing units that had we just been living under the existing inclusionary zoning requirement, uh, which is which says that private development in the city, you've got to build somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of your total units need to be affordable, and that affordability can be used to be at levels of 80 percent or 60 percent of area median income. This requirement that we have on city projects is a tangible sort of inflection point and result process change that we made three and a half years ago, sort of based on this issue that we know that we're trying to make in, uh, investments around um, education and health care and public safety, and we need to start treating housing literally as an, almost like an infrastructure or an issue that we need to be making policy statements specifically around. Great. So, Mayor Goldsmith, how would your how would this notion of a, of a distributive, open, collaborative governance system respond to challenges like housing affordability and, and gentrification? What, how, how can you either have what you've seen, or how can you imagine that this new form of governance that you talk about in your book would support these challenges of cities being a lot more successful than they might have uh, anticipated? Well, we have, we have a number of. <laughs> Pretty complex uh, issues you've just raised in the last couple questions, and yeah, to 
you know, and to some extent, right, that Brian, I mean, to a large extent, Brian's dealing with large macro issues mm -hmm. and trying to use public policy to uh, uh, ameliorate the problems that success creates. Um, and so that doesn't have an easy solution. Right. So, but you could, but attempting to kind of connect uh, your question in the book to Brian's note, it, it might look something like as follows. Um, well visualized open data tells us a lot about communities, right? When uh, Mayor Garcetti vis visualized uh, in a geo geographic way all of the public data in LA, immediately you could tell that uh, the, the sanitation conditions in certain neighborhoods uh, from public works were not the same as in other neighborhoods, right? Uh, it allowed in Chicago advocacy groups or nonprofit organizations to manipulate the data to demonstrate activities that were occurring in their community, right? It allows organizations to be advocates for uh, fairness in the way police treat their residents by kind of looking at circumstances uh, by, you know, by the ethnicity of the person who's arrested or stopped in the location, right? So, what, so one way to think about this is if we're thinking about distributed platforms, either through individuals themselves or through maybe their proxies, right, community-based organizations, uh, ANCs or whatever, you have people who are a lot smarter in advocating in their own best interest. Another way to think about it is um, the way Brian said, which is we're going to identify and, and predict these trends more effectively with the data that will tell us what's going to happen in that community. And then you can also then say, oh, well, wait a minute, there's, a, there's other aspects as well. Uh, well, Louisville and Chicago and other places have now air sensors, right? And how do we connect the, the health of a community with the air quality in the community in a very discreet way? So, so a lot of the stuff that, that we accepted as, um, uh, uh, we just accepted as the conditions in poor neighborhoods no longer needs to be accepted. The tools are there to identify that and then, and then build on that as well. So those are just different ways to think about the answer to your question. Sure. So Scott, not only are you are you situated physically between uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Kenner and Mayor Goldsmith, but I think that the work that you're doing with 11th Street Bridge literally connects some of the things around new ways of listening, around improving low-income neighborhoods in place, while thinking a lot about issues of affordability. So tell us a little bit about how you see the uh, 11th Street Bridge project as kind of the, literally the bridge between these two, uh, you know, the the new ways of resident engagement and these giant questions about what's a, who is a city for? Yeah, so <clears throat> first of all, it's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Um, so for those that don't know, the really quick sort of overview, we are partnering with the city. Um, the, I work for a nonprofit um, based east of the river, based in Congress Heights, called appropriately enough Building Bridges Across the River. Um, the, we run a 203,000 square foot um, the facility located in Congress Heights that has 14 nonprofits that exist in sort of one building. And we're partnering with the city, with DDOT, uh, the District Department of Transportation, to transform an old freeway bridge that it has aged out <clears throat> and reusing some of that infrastructure to build a new um, park that can physically and metaphorically bridge communities. I think when we started, I'll, I'll answer the question in two different ways. I think when we started back in 2011, 2012, um, the, we, before we got any architects involved, engineers, landscape architects, anybody else, we needed to go out and talk to the community and not say what colors should the deck chairs be, right? But actually take several steps back and say, should we do this, right? Was this viable? Does, does the community even want this? Um, and we had over 200 meetings in those first two years um, the, with faith leaders, with ANC commissioners, with business leaders, with youth. Um, the, we worked with uh, young men and women who are participating in the city's summer youth employment program um, the, that Courtney mentioned, um, and paired them up with architects and landscape architects to design what the park should be that was our model for um, the putting in front of uh, designers. Um, but having that, I think the, the reason why I'm overemphasizing that is that particularly when we're working in communities of need, there is an enormous and justifiable trust deficit, right? People have come in those communities and for a variety of reasons have, have made a lot of promises and some of those promises haven't been kept, right? So I think it's about building trust and that trust is about shared experiences over time, right? And that trust is extraordinarily fragile. Um, but when we uh, were out there talking to the community, they recognized that this was a big ambitious task, but they also said, well, let's 
we're excited about this. And we said, all right, well, then help us shape it. Help us drive every single programming element that's on the part of the park that then was incorporated as part of a design competition. And the community actually was embedded as part of the design competition where the community got to vote. And I didn't vote, right, on the, on the final design. The community did, right, on the, which was great. But the second part, so I think one, that sort of constant building and a constant community feedback loop is critical. But the second thing is I think when we were out there in the community listening to ideas of what kind of programming should be on this park, we heard a lot of great ideas for a performance space, environmental education center, cafe, restaurant, access to the river. But we also heard a much greater need. We heard a need for housing, right? We heard a need for workforce development. We heard a need for um, wealth creation, right? Um, so soon after we announced the, 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 um, the design team, um, the, we started working with um, members of the Office of Planning with the district. This has been a public-private partnership from the beginning um, with senior scholars from the Urban Institute, LISC DC, DC Fiscal Policy Institute, to take a look at a discrete one-mile area around the park and think, how can the Bridge Park act as a larger convener to think about answering the very simple question, um, the very complicated answer of how do you invest in places of need without displacing the same residents you're trying to serve, right? I think we in DC have seen an enormous amount of growth, right? What, 1,100 people a month um, have been moving in, over 100,000 residents um, they have been moving in in the last 12 years, it's enormous. How do we ensure that that prosperity, that, that we're um, thinking intentionally, um, the, we're thinking about it through a community-driven um, sort of effort, and we're thinking about this really early, right, um, the, to set some of these um, policy um, in, in place and some of these strategic actions. And the last thing I'll say is what came out of this larger community-driven process was an equitable development plan that has strategies in housing, workforce development, small business enterprises, and we've since gone back and added in cultural equity strategies and political equity strategies to ensure that the thousands of people who've helped shape, build this, shape this park to begin with can be the ones that benefit from it. I'm going to stick with this theme of trust. Um, you know, as, as some of you may know, the Aspen Institute prides itself on values-based discussion, and we like to connect these giant you know, humanistic concepts like trust with the wonky day-to-day -day of policy. So Brian, how does, how does this notion of trust between government and residents play out in your, in your work? And what, are, what do you do at, at DEMPED to kind of shore up uh, some of the, the trust deficits that, that Scott has talked about? And then uh, I'll come to you, uh, Mayor Goldsmith, to talk about kind of trust and accountability and transparency. Uh, I'm going to try to I'm going to answer that in two different ways. One is that, <clears throat> you know, for us, trust um, is the basis upon which we are able to be taken seriously, to be uh, believed, and for people to understand what our intent is. And so, the only way that I know how to do that is to try as much as possible to say what it is that we are going to do and what we can promise to do. I, I cannot fix every single ailment that's out there. I won't be able to ameliorate every condition or issue. I can't guarantee that every single person is going to have a job. I can't guarantee that every single person is going to have access to the housing that suits them. Uh, I cannot necessarily guarantee that every small business that is created or has an idea is going to be successful in the District of Columbia. What I can uh, promise you to do is I can talk about why we're trying to do the things that we're doing and what we hope the intent of it is. How many people we are going to be focused on making sure to get jobs. How many people we are, how many affordable housing units we are going to be creating for this community. So as much as possible, it's about trying to just be honest with what it is that we can do and you know, trying to make sure that people understand at least the intent uh, uh, for what our actions are. The, the second part of your, your question, though, is it, my best way to answer that is that it's complicated. If you think that I go to a community meeting, uh, as I often do, and let's just say that I go to a community meeting at Congress Heights, which I did about two months ago, um, if you, does anybody believe that I get one overriding comment only? Uh, if I go, as an example, uh, if I go to Congress sites today, or if I go to Historic Anacostia, which is actually more interesting, 
uh, and I say affordable housing, the answer is what? What do people tell me? Corruption. Corruption? Okay, maybe not that one as much, but I appreciate that. Um, rent is too damn high, so they need it, right? They want it. Would that be a fair answer to your... Uh, that is not the predominant thing, especially in historic Anacostia that I get. They say, I already have it. I already have all this affordable housing. Like, why? I want market housing. I want, where's my grocery store, by the way? Like, west of the river, I see all this stuff. I don't see it in my community, so like, where is that? How come you guys aren't talking about market rate housing? That's what I want in my community. So like, I get, it. it there is no overriding community voice that guides us simply. And I know that Scott has heard that in his hundreds of community meetings, which is that there's different people, there's different perspectives about everything. And so, you know, this trust issue is about trying to be honest about what you can provide because you're not going to make everybody happy. Like, you're, there, there is no, whether that's east of the river or west of the river, there's no, I've, I've one out of 400 community meetings I've been to, gone, done, where there's just one voice that overrides where you can say, aha, I got it. I know exactly what they want. Typically, and especially in these emerging neighborhoods where they're uh, simultaneously wanting and fearing things at the same time, you find this great tension. And I think that is, you know, frankly, I think that's sort of the economic development challenge of every amenity-rich city today is that you're, you find these, this tension in how sort of government builds trust but also executes on a vision that in the long term is going to be best for those residents. That is sort of the du jour issue today. And are there tools that you are using now uh, that, that help you at least communicate, at, at least help you tell the story that, that you want to tell? Because that's the, so I'm, I'm, I'm feeding you a lot of questions because I know that you have to leave us sure. in about four minutes. So sure. I want to maximize your uh, talking uh, time. You know, um, you know, we're, you know, I think like most places, I mean, we're trying to take, a, take advantage of technology. We've got social media, we've got social media surveys, we've got surveying uh, sort of tools that we've used. Um, to be frank about it though, I think there's nothing like old fashioned communications. The best uh, communication tool that I have ever seen is someone's story. And that's not my story, but it's someone who's there, uh, a resident, a worker, um, you name it. Uh, that is the person, that is the people, that's the feeling that you get, there's nothing that replaces the feeling of trying to communicate uh, issues or trying to tell the intent of what you're trying to do, like a personal story. And so I, I, I still believe that that is actually the most powerful tool. Great. Mayor Goldsmith, your book talks a lot about um, transparency and accountability and how, as, as you said in your, in your opening remarks, we, use, we built all these systems to make sure that everybody followed the rules and nobody could cheat. And that's how we, that's how we had trust in government in starting in the progressive era. And now with new tools, we need to think differently about accountability and trust. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I was, I was telling Brian before he sat down, so just to have to show my uh, authenticity here. I was chairman of the Anacostia Redevelopment Commission pre-baseball. <laughs> and uh, we were spending a, a, a billion dollars and had no one's trust, I think, right? <laughs> right. Even the beneficiaries, yeah, I don't exactly. think, trusted us. So I, I, I appreciate the complexity of the problem. Uh, and I also know that Brian's got to get out. So let me, just, let me, uh, yeah, let me bucket it this way, first of all. Um, there's a difference between trust and everybody being happy with government, right? And, you know, and a lot of people don't want to have a really close personal relationship with their government, right? They, they want their problems solved. So, so I, I think about this in, in a couple different ways. Let's take it at the most minor level. Every day when a resident has uh, an interaction with his or her government, uh, we ought to start by making that as, as easy to do and responsive as possible. Right, there's, there's no reason why, well, there are plenty of reasons why that your experience with Amazon is quite different than your experience with government generally, even though it's, of course, good and perfect in the district, but not everywhere, right? So, so let's think about how, how we can personalize your relationship with government. What do you need to know? How can, how can, how can what government has to offer make your life uh, better, right? I've got a complaint. I need to get a driver's license. I want to know what time the, 
the uh, basketball court lights go off at night. I want to know X, right? And how can I make that as easy as possible, right? And, and outbound SMS messaging, how do we personalize that? How do we do that? So every day there's a set of those things. B, I've got a problem, right? How, how, how much transparency can I get in, into, into when will that problem be resolved? Brian's comment about expectations is tremendously important, right? People get frustrated when their expectations mismatch what's possible, right? So, so using the data to visualize those expectations. The issue about, um, about um, a narrative is really important as well, right? So the data, we can do story mapping, right? We can tell stories with data as well about what's happening in a community. So, so I think that the, the, the so that's one way to think about trust from little to big. Another way to think about trust is um, how do we use, how do we visualize the data that allow, allows folks in one community to understand life in another community, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're, 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 we have this polarization in, in, in society generally and have economic polarization in all successful cities. And so, so it's important that we create a sense of, a sense of play so that people can understand uh, what needs to happen for others to benefit in the community. So, so I would just say that trust is wide ranging. Uh, it starts with the mayor, frankly, and where, when, when she says something, do people trust her? And then how does her government uh, uh, fulfill its responsibilities in a way that she gets, uh, has more trust? And that allows her then to articulate big overarching solutions to problems um, because uh, the folks trust her on a day-to-day -day basis. So I, I'd say it's kind of all in. The policies need to be right, they need to be inclusive, but folks need to kind of understand what their government's doing. Okay. Brian, before you go, anything you want to add or uh, leave with our, with our audience? I'm not kicking you out, but um, I, appreciate that. I need to um, maintain a good working relationship I, with your staff. I appreciate <laughs> that. Um, not, I mean, not really, I just, you know, this, this issue and I think I see the hashtag better city for who. Um, I just, I, I firmly believe that this is going to be a bigger and bigger issue in cities every single year. I, I don't see, I see Washington as being an example, but I think that if you go to Chicago, Boston, Austin, New York City, Denver, it doesn't matter. Places where people are moving to, which increasingly is cities, and that's not just young people, that is people of color, that's women, that's older people that are all moving to cities more and more or closer to cities. I think this issue of how are cities changing and who benefits and how can we make sure that the most people benefit and how do we make sure the city is inclusive of as many people as possible is the issue that we're all going to be faced with uh, increasingly in the future. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, you know, you, uh, Brian, you brought up the issue, and, and you can leave while I'm talking about it. I appreciate you. it. Um, you brought up the issue of this tension between what people want and what they fear. I think another tension that, that is happening in, in cities is the tension around time. So, Mayor Goldsmith, in your book, you talk about needing to respond in real time. And yet, Scott, one of the things that's clear about the work around the 11th Street Bridge is needing to move, um, as uh, my friend Lauren Ellen McCann says, at the speed of trust, which is not always lightning fast <laughs> in communities where there's a trust deficit. So can you talk a little bit about how you're managing that, that people want to see change quickly, whether that's your government partners, your philanthropic funders, and yet if you move too fast, that can, be, uh, that can actually go against your larger goal. Yeah, um, two things to that. Um, <clears throat> the one is I think when you're, um, so I think timing is critical, right? Um, the in sequencing is critically important, right? I mean, in, 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 in many other cities, you, um, the, an investment happens and then it's, oh wait, what just happened and we've had so much success, right? Um, the, and, um, and at that point, once the market sort of finds um, the a neighborhood, it's going to move so much faster than certainly a nonprofit, or I'd argue probably even the government um, that can move. It's just going to move, capital is going to move that much faster. That's just the system we're in. So I think setting those, um, the uh, strategies in place, I mean, in our case, setting it five years before the earliest we could open the park, I think is really important and really critical. Um, 
I think, too, one of the things that we thought about as we were developing the strategies for the equitable development plan, there were strategies that were in there that are going to take a minute to um, starting a community land trust of which we are starting um, the is going to take a minute, right? I mean, it's separate pri private nonprofit you need to create, you need to create an advisory committee that turns into a board, you need to think about your bylaws and blah, 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 all that stuff, right? So we're doing all of that. But but as we were creating these strategies, it was really critical to have some early wins that were in there, right? Um, the, so in our case, we had an early win that <clears throat> we um, partnered with uh, another amazing nonprofit, MANA, who's been serving um, the, the DC region for 20 plus years, um, the, who've been running a very successful home buyers club um, the, at their headquarters in Ward 5. And we said, hey, can we partner with you and start your home buyers club east of the river, right? And so the recommendations came out in December, and in January, we started a home buyers club, right? In the last two years, that home buyers club has seen over 200 residents, 200 Ward 8 residents. Now, over 60 of those Ward 8 renters are now property owners, right? Um, the, so capturing some of that uh, long-term wealth, right? Generational wealth. So I think thinking about um, the having some early wins, thinking about some deliverables that you can point to, it's the sort of um, uh, thinking incrementally, but um, the that um, builds on that, I think is critically important. And then the other thing I think is, sort of making sure that we're all collectively accessible, right? I mean, I think Brian and, and his whole team, like we're out at every community meeting, um, the, and Brian's team, whether it's DDOT, whether it's Office of Planning, whether it's DHED, whether, I mean, are out there at these same meetings, right? We need to be present. We need to sort of be there so you have uh, somebody that you, you, you can start building those relationships that you know who you can talk to. I mean, I knew that one sort of short story, I knew we were making success when um, uh, a resident in Fairlawn, um, the, which is just next to Anacostia, um, called and I got yelled at, right? And what I mean by that is somebody was putting up flyers in Fairlawn saying we were going to clean up the neighborhood and somehow word got out that it was the 11th Street Bridge Park and we had nothing to do with it and I didn't, I never, still haven't figured out sort of who put those up, but the residents were ticked off, right? They were like, who is coming outside our neighborhood and saying that they have the right to come in and clean up their neighborhood? They were up, they were just justifi justifiably upset, right? We never figured out who that was that were putting those flyers up, but they knew who to call, right? Because we had built sort of those relationships. Um, and I think we, like um, the all well, DEMPED staff and city staff, need to make sure that we're accessible. And because otherwise, um, the um, narratives get created, right? Whether those are true or not, narratives get created. And, and if we have that sort of access, um, the to whether it's sort of the nonprofit world um, the, that's out there or the city officials, um, the that's uh, that accessibility is key and can't be understated. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. So, Mayor Goldsmith, what is one thing that you think, um, when you when you look at all the examples um, in your book, is there is there one thing that really stands out, or is there one example that you think people should uh, that, that you'd like to see a lot more of, or is it or is it kind of are you advocating for process change as opposed to everybody should adopt a, an air monitoring system like Louisville? Well. Um, uh, Let's just take the last several questions and say, several answers and synthesize them in an answer to this question, right? This is why you're the professor. So that's so why. Yeah, I think I like mayor to the title better than professor, <laughs> but um, um, or even deputy mayor, right? So, um, so uh, government is set up vertically, but people live horizontally, right? They don't live in the parks department. They don't live in a, in a D dot, right? They live at um, they live in Anacostia, or they live at 10th and Main, and, and they see problems in the, kind of the system, the ecosystem of their neighborhood. And, and government's set up this way. So, so the big breakthroughs come as we think about government as a platform that allows its agencies to work horizontally and allows those agencies to understand they work in a platform system where there's the, all knowledge doesn't, isn't inside City Hall. Right, so, so they need to look peripherally in City Hall, and then they need to look out in the distributed system. They need to find ways to learn. They need to find ways to pose a question, take the data, iterate the policy, and then eventually act to your, to your last question. So the big thing for me is when they're, and DC is doing a very good job today compared to other cities, right, is, is how we have, um, you know, like the deputy mayor is in charge of equity. Who's, who's in charge of looking across the agencies? How do the data guys, right, the policy labs in D.C., um, with, with their uh, very strong men and women who work there, how do they look at 
trends across, right? So, so, and you can play this exercise any sort of way. You know, is the problem with homelessness in the homeless department, or is it in the the uh, drug therapy or mental health or domestic violence departments, right? Is, is I was at an event with the mayor um, and uh, uh, the CEO of Uber, right? And the question there was, you know, what what is it that keeps folks from uh, getting transportation that would allow them to have a job where they don't have the transportation to a job today, right? So I, I say the one big thing is to set up platforms that allow government to be smarter in the way it listens and the way it acts and to respond more quickly. Great. Can, can I jump in and just um, the underline that this is absolutely critical. <clears throat> we think a lot about um, the, and there's a lot of talk about how do we think about cross-sector on um, the work, but this is really, and this is not only critical, but it's also where the really fun stuff happens, right? If we're, if we're for instance, looking at um, the, we're about to acquire, I, I think, knock on wood, our first community land trust property, right? A 65 unit apartment building in Congress Heights, super exciting. Those, each of those buildings are going to, each of those um, units are going to need to be renovated, right? So how do we make sure we're then aligning with our small business enterprises who are based locally that we've been building capacity for so that those small businesses east of the river who are actually doing the renovation? And then how do we think to make sure that those CVEs, that those small businesses are hiring locally and tapping into our workforce development piece, right? That's where you start to see true leverage. Like that's, I mean, that's what you're talking on a citywide level, but right, right. that's where you're starting to see huge um, the shifts. And I think what's interesting is when we were developing the equitable development plan, that's what we heard from residents was like, stop thinking about this through like the housing bucket and the workforce development bucket and the um, the small business bucket or cultural bucket, whatever, because life doesn't work that way, right? I mean, our lives sort of intersect in these and sort of every every single but day. That's, that's why your job is important, right? Because you're in charge of a place, right? Sure. You're not in charge of an activity, you're in charge of a place and you're knitting together the activities to create a sense of place. Mm -hmm. But I, I like that you brought up the idea of fun, that it makes your job a lot more fun. <laughs> and uh, Mayor Goldsmith, you also note in your book that the people who work in city government will just have a whole lot better day to day if they're allowed to be the thoughtful, creative professionals that they can be as opposed to being uh, you know, what we think of as bureaucrats in the negative way, if they're forced into this kind of checklist life. So I think there's something kind of profoundly uh, Humanizing about the about this wonky subject of, of better government. Yeah, people look. I've been in local government for thirty years. And I, I haven't found a lot of the folks who worked for me who took their jobs because they wanted to make a lot of money. Right? <laughs> it's just not kind of why they signed up. They signed up to help people in their community. Then they get in these jobs where they have no discretion. They can't solve problems. Or you know, the the definition of performance is to get the pieces of paper on the left side of the desk to the right side of the desk before you go home at night. And it just beats them down, right? And so, you, and actually, there are research studies that show productivity increases when people believe that they're solving a problem in their community. So we have those tools now, and it, it does create, it does make uh, work fun. Great. Um, so this is the last question, um, and it's uh, pretty much a softball. So I hope you enjoy answering it. Um, Scott, what's the one thing that you want people to leave this afternoon with? What's the one insight or idea or inspiration that you want people to leave with? I think the um, when we do this work, um, we need to be intentional, right? Um, the and the I'm going to cheat and say sort of one and a half things. Um, the and and what's really critical is that it's community driven, right? The thing that we become totally obsessed with is how do we build more capacity in the community, right? To drive some of this change, to shape the neighborhoods, how they look, feel, and function, right? And we're leading community leadership empowerment workshops and sort of other things, but. I think the assets and resources already exist in the communities. It's just we need, we being government or nonprofits or whatever, need to make sure that um, the we can do our best to amplify and lift up those voices. Great. Mayor Gold? Do you have that other slide I had? Uh, absolutely. I and, two yeah. slides. Can I just you, want to see the other one. Can you do, it's two slides ahead? Uh, yeah. So and then the one next more. one. There okay. We go. So basically, Thanks. my one answer is four since Scott took two. <laughs> um, so, how do you design government around the user experience of its residents, right? The same as you'd use a user experience on your app, on your iPhone or Android, government needs to organize itself around the user, not around the bureaucracy, right? And we talked about the problem solving public servant. Government can act in time, right? We, we, there is a reason why red tape is called red tape. And we don't need, we need red tape when we had pieces of paper to tape up, right? We don't need pieces of paper. And we ought to be able to, you know, when I was, uh, 
I, I'm going to exaggerate this story, but when I was deputy mayor of New York, here's how we gave a restaurant license. If you're a small person, small business, you'd borrow money, fa family and friends, to open your own restaurant. By 18 months later, you'd get your 12th permit that allowed you to finally open your restaurant the day you ran out of money, right? Just almost perfectly timed. So after, you know, agency one passed to agency two, passed to agency three, right? So how do you act in time, right? And, and then, and then how do you create an ecosystem, right? How do you change the procurement system? How do you change the HR system? How do you change the bureaucratic rule system? So if you get those four things right, then you generate more trust in government, and that allows you to do the big aspirational things that, that Brian and Scott have talked about. So I think the connection is if you, if you can do um, the, the easier and more mechanical stuff well, you do have a lot more capacity to invest in the, what humans have to do and which takes time, which is, which is the larger building trust.